It is, in my view, a common misconception that spells and rituals are reserved for denominations of magic, witchcraft and the like. It is not the case. Words vocalized or in thought form are a spell, which can be of different intensities depending on the intention behind them, and a ritual is a symbolic sequence of gestures and spells performed in a given order. Therefore, we have all, willingly or unwillingly, performed spells and rituals in a collective manner, but we also do it in our daily lives, individually. If we look closely, showering and getting dressed is a ritual, as it usually follows the same procedures every day, and saying good morning to someone is casting a spell that can either be aimed at initiating a necessary conversation or transmitting acknowledgement of presence to another. While rituals and spells such as these can go from being innocuous to useful, to detrimental, to outright evil, we should first understand what spells and rituals are actually made of, so that we can then be mindful and alert to choose which to power. It is impossible to exist in this reality without performing a ritual or a spell. Even if one takes a vow of silence, that is already a ritual, to decide not to cast spells verbally, yet it does not prevent them from being applied in thought form. Therefore, the aim should never be to avoid these altogether, which is quite impossible in this reality. And this is not specific to humans, for animals have a highly ritualized behavior in their natural habitats, where gestures, postures, and vocalizations will bring about a lot of information to the mind of the observer, causing that observer to act or react in a certain way. That is exactly what some human magic is, a uh, means to inform, that is, to create a form within the other so that concepts, intentions or ideas can be considered or understood and, if that's the case, performed. Every time we order something at a restaurant or shop, we are casting a spell that aims at the other person understanding, that is, forming within themselves, what it is that we require, so that it then can be obtained. What it might be not so simple to realize is that although the customer and shopkeeper have knowledge of the same code and so are able to identify the correct required object, the words transmitted never ever actually define the object. That is done both by the emitter and receiver of the communication spell. If I say, I'd like a coffee, please, I am not defining what coffee is, and if the waiter did not know the meaning of the words beforehand, he would not be able to get me coffee. Moreover, the waiter might afterwards ask what kind of coffee, served in which type of cup, with or without anything added such as milk or whatever, which shows how much the word coffee is never defining of the real thing which, being real, is not true, because reality is not truth. But it's merely an attempt at approximation. Now, you go to the same coffee shop often. Um, the shopkeeper there may remember how you like your coffee, because you have repeated the same ritual several times with him already. After several times with the same request and satisfactory conclusion shown to him, again another ritual and spell, the waiter was willingly programmed to serve you better by allowing your form of the word coffee to be included in his memory or spell book, so that you didn't have to go through the whole description again. This is an innocuous example, but it is a good example of how spells and rituals work. They generate memory embedding of an intention. If one is conscious of that embedding and decides it is useful or even necessary, a spell effect can easily be switched on or off in one's programming at will. As soon as the customer leaves, that spell is willingly switched off, going back to the memory. Additionally, if, for a long time, 
the customer does not come back, it may even be completely forgotten or erased and no longer work. However, if a spell or ritual is not performed at a conscious level, then it may remain active and control one's emotions, thoughts and actions. Additionally, it may also involve other constructs that are not visible in our reality, but that exist and influence it, which can influence us then in a hidden, ma a hidden manner without or even against our volition. This is important to understand when observing reality, knowing full well that there are construct entities in it that wish to cast certain spells and program rituals in everyone else for their own ends, even on those who oppose or disagree with them. We keep observing their spell casting and ritual performing, uh, trying to inform us, that is to make us allow their desired form to come into our inner temples. As others have more eloquently put, they want us to generate their reality for them. Yes, a mat reference here. Quite correct. It is therefore essential not to get too involved in the dissection of the rituals and spells, but it is also essential to consciously observe and recognize them. There is a good reason why ex exorcists are required to get the demon possessing the individual to state their name, that is, to be recognized. When the demon is recognized, it becomes weak, as it cannot live under the attention of the conscious mind, and is banished, at least at that moment. Now, I am not asking anyone to believe or disbelieve that demon possession is real or not. That's not my point in bringing this example to the table. But I am instead making an analogy between the two. A demon can simply be seen as programmed, uh, a programmed form of thought and action that was placed and given power unconsciously or subconsciously, taking hold of the individual. If one then recognizes the demon or program by knowing its name, so to speak, that is, uh, what defines it, just by doing so, by recognition and making the subconscious conscious, one is able to release, at least partially, the hold it might have held on the mind. 9-11, for example, was for us, even for myself, and I am not American, nor am I in the same continent, a huge ritual with several spells that had a very deep and intense effect for a significant amount of time. Yet when we were able to decode the ritual, and, at least, uh, the most significant spells of that event, it lost its power over us. That is, for those of us who really were successful at doing that, for it still holds power even for some people who have been witnessing the ritual identification for years. This is the importance of my reiteration of truth speaks no words. For all spellcasting involves words, and if words cannot ever define truth, it cannot be found in them. So spells can shape reality, but nothing can shape truth. It already and simply and eternally is. It doesn't become anything. Reality can and will always become something because it is composed of the opposite of truth, and so it can never simply be. So never ever take mine or any other's words as truth. One may find them agreeable or disagreeable. One may find them pointing towards some approximation of what truth may seem to be or farther from it. But no words will ever be truth. There isn't a single religion in the present reality that does not involve some kind of scripture reading or listening, prayer, chanting or invocation. There isn't a single religion in the present reality that does not involve one sort or another of collective and individual ritual. Now, I am not judging these to be for the approximation to or deviation from what we can realize of truth. That is not the point and it is up to each of us to discern and decide. 
As I have said in another, vi uh, another video, religion comes from the Latin religare, which means to reconnect. So to reconnect to a truth that we knew before reality and words and rituals. What I am trying to convey is that none of us, regardless of our preferred texts, myths, prayers or rituals, can ever find the truth in them, but we may realize truth through them. Taking the textual and or the ritualized as true, that is, taking them as the end of seeking, is to not only give life to the purposes they defined for their own ends, which are mostly contradictory to our mindful, sincere and loving seeking, but also to ensure we do not find anything even remotely resembling truth. Only the cheap copies thrown at us by those who, by acceptance of such spells and rituals from them, we have allowed to become our mental handlers in dependency. The text, the word, the gesture, the posture, the action can only ever be a tool or a means to come to realize some of the truth, but it can never be it in its stead. When previously I mentioned that it would be to give life to their purposes, I meant our life, we that have it and they don't, at least not anymore if ever they did, so they need us. Given all that was addressed in this contemplation, and as I also mentioned rituals that do not involve words but gestures, actions, postures, objects and so on, I will also have to take it a step further and affirm truth speaks no words nor does it move or become.